everyone. This is Brian Setzer of the Setzer Group, and we're continuing our summer series on barriers for breakfast, where we get a chance to talk about innovators doing work in the space today, innovators that have spent their career really looking at obstacles and challenges and barriers and saying, you know, how might we and what might we do uh, to think differently to get to the outcomes we all want? So it's a very rare treat when I get to bring on a friend and colleague, but also somebody that is supervised me directly. So I hope that we get into some things today that can, you know, challenge some assumptions, assuage some myths, and think a little bit about how we all come together throughout our careers to add value to students and teachers and leaders. And so I'm here with Susan Allred of Susan Allred Consulting. She's also a member of my advisory board at Setzer Group. She's done work with a host of organizations, including school districts and the Kentucky Department of Education as an interim associate commissioner. And she's also done work with the Southern Regional Education Board. So recently she's been able to also find the time to work on the second edition of her book, Without Trumpets. And it, it's a must read for those leaders thinking about organizational change. And it also kicks off our topic today, which is kind of looking at innovation from the state level and thinking about how we can make an impact in our states in the way that Susan and her teams did in Kentucky. And I'm just thrilled to have her aboard. So Susan, welcome. And uh, I'll dive right in here. Uh, why did you decide to join today? You know, why are you still in this work? Why are you continuing to make this such a purpose uh, in your life of helping others kind of change the odds for kids and students and, and leaders? Well, it's delightful that you ask me. I would probably have camped on your doorstep <laughs> until you did. Um, but I have been in the work exactly 50 years. Um, I graduated from college in 1971 and started teaching in 1971. Why would I still be at it is because I still believe that education is the foundation of what we are supposed to be doing as a society. And when we're getting it wrong, we can correct it. There, that's, it's not rocket science. It's not that hard. We have to understand how people we are working with are prepared to do what it is we are expecting of them. Too frequently, we put the goals out there for all of the workforce and never really get the workforce on board. That has been consistently true since I started. And my best example, I'll give you just right out of the chute, this is out of the book too, so you don't even have to pay money to get it. And that <laughs> is that every year that I was a public school person and was in a building, whether that was as a classroom teacher or as an assistant principal or a principal, every year we had at least two or three full faculty meetings about getting kids to class on time. Now, I am from a generation that lets you mainstream music on your watch, um, have commercial flights to outer space, and we can't get teenagers to class on time. That makes no sense. Why is that? It's because we didn't work on the systems that we built to deliver education. And so why am I still at it? When I figured it out, I just couldn't shut up. And so that's why I'm here today. <laughs> now, so much to chew on there. We're here with uh, Susan Allred, uh, author, uh, mentor, former associate uh, director of, um, or associate commissioner rather in education of Next Gen Learning and also has done work with a host of organizations. And we were just talking about her book Without Trumpets and kind of some things that we're learning on the big whys of transformation and why we do this work. I think what I'd love to segue on the what is kind of, you know, what key lessons, what things have you observed in helping people understand and gain buy-in so that if you're working particularly from the state level and I'm a district superintendent or I'm a district leader or a teacher, how do I begin to learn what it is that we're trying to all go at together and then how do I begin to adopt that so real change can happen? And I know you've written about it in the book, but I'd, I'd love to hear your rift on that. You know, I was really fortunate when I went to Kentucky because they were going through a transition time and they were moving from just closing gaps to the graduation rate. 
And so when I got to the department and we were starting to write regulations that were to, to provide the, the structure for support, we were all going to be focusing on graduation rate rather than just on math and language arts scores. So we had an opportunity to take a thing and say, here's what we're going after. Um, many times when state departments start to work in districts, it's because something has happened in the district that sets off alarms. So that student performance in some of our Kentucky districts, it was um, fi financial trouble, you know, not being able to, to meet next month's payroll, those kinds of things. So you have all these things that cause them to be stressed. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting to me to see that when we just started talking about graduation rate mm -hmm. and what is it that we really want for our students instead of how'd you do on the last test? Right. When we started having that conversation mm -hmm. and the fact that I was a foreigner, I came from North Carolina, right? So, right, right. so the fact that we had this conversation level with the lowest performing schools mm -hmm. began to shake up just mm -hmm. how we were talking. So it's, I would say the first thing is, do you have a thing that everybody's working for? Not just because the state said so or because there's a piece of legislation that just got passed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I found um, when I went to work in Kentucky that there were 41 active laws on the books mm -hmm. about support and the um, gaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are 41 laws on the books, why are we not making the progress we need to be making? And right. it's simply because there's never been a really great translation of how does that change things mm -hmm. at the desktop? Right. And so the idea is find the one, two, or three things that, buddy, this organization is mm -hmm. absolutely going to work on. And everybody is going to have the same conversation. Mm -hmm. And then align your processes, mm -hmm. the things that you are asking the schools and districts to do, mm -hmm. align it. Get rid of all those extra reports. Just get the ones that you need to help mm -hmm. you help them make the difference in the day-to-day -day activities. And of course, we were working with um, schools that were under the school improvement grant, which came out of the Obama administration. So that's the, the time frame that I'm talking about. The fact that we have two books is to show that there is continuity, even after I'm sitting here on my porch rocking in North Carolina, that there are still leaders in that state who realize the alignment of processes need to occur. That if you want students to close gaps, then everything that you do from a state level must be aligned Everybody's got to be working for the same stuff. And you then support that. And that support in Kentucky has grown. And that's the second book, too. That's great. Um, I, it makes me think of um, some how questions around the great stories. Because I think when leaders uh, try to impact the how or they try to understand it, they often want to hear from a peer. They often want to hear from you know, a benchmark district, et cetera. And so I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you, but I'm going to share it quickly and then would love to get into some of the how stories in Kentucky that, you know, really would tune the listeners into, you know, now that they've got the big why, they understand what the law is or the school improvement plan outcomes or whatever it may be. And now they uh, get into some of those tactics. Uh, how does the work take place and how does it end up at outcomes, right? And that's really when people start to hear those stories that they can rally around. So after my time with you and, and Terry Holiday and Iredale State School, I had a chance to go lead the North Carolina Virtual Public School. And I very quickly thought about sort of this, you know, notion of putting first things first and how I was going to do it as a leader, but also how I was going to modify it. And I made 
some change around. Uh, Terry had a way of, uh, you know, uh, expecting things on a Friday afternoon. And then Monday, we had a staff meeting very early to start to execute on those things. And I made a decision very early that I was going to make that staff meeting kind of one or two o'clock on Monday so that people had some time uh, to go to the Susan Allred's desk of the worlds, which I often did and kind of make sense with it, right? And how am I going to position it? I've done my homework, but what am I going to do to really seek change and adoption? Because once you have it leave the district desk, it needs to go to the school, it needs to go to the classroom. And that's where the real work, you know, kind of comes into play. So I'm really curious when, when they looked at all those variables in Kentucky and they said, you know, all right, now we've got to get this down through the system and then back up so that people are adopting it. They're telling stories about it. What's impressed you in learning about what happened in Kentucky? Are there a couple places where people were just like, man, this is fantastic. They really got it all the way through the system. Not at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think that, that if you interview people who were in leadership in the schools and districts where the schools and districts had been identified for state support. You'll get great stories. Um, Larry, Larry Sparks at Leslie County said, when I went to and met him for the first time and he told me about being identified and he said it was a gut punch. And that's where I had to start with him. I was talking to a man who was the superintendent of a district who felt like he had had a gut punch. And so you have to, you have to start right there. Um, then I was also in Lawrence County to begin with. And that journey honestly took about seven years for them. So you have to be willing to go in and say, okay, what is it? And then equip them and support them as they get better and better and better. So they had people who became systems thinkers, but they had to learn how to do that. And for some people, like in Leslie County, it moved faster. And there, this is nobody's fault. If people could fix this, they would have. The thing that I would say about Kentucky that is desperately unique is that in every setting where I visited, nobody blamed the children. Nobody blamed the children. Yeah. They were ready to do anything that we were bringing to the table. Mm. But they told us very quickly, now we've been helped to death. The state's been in here a lot. Right. And so you can't, you can't be selling a bill of goods. Mm -hmm. You've got to hear what their story is because they're the workers. And so that's the principal sometimes. It's the teacher sometimes. It is the board sometimes. Mm -hmm. But everybody has to be a player in the solution. Um, and the Leslie story is a much faster story. They were ready. Mm -hmm. um, and the... Lawrence's story, I think, is a very successful story. We interviewed one of the teachers for, for the second edition, and she talks about how it changed her as a professional and what she still does today as a classroom teacher, 10 years into the process. Mm -hmm. um, but when you talk about what's the how and is there a miracle, you know what? It's not a miracle. And that's what I keep saying is, folks, this is just about making sure that there is respect for every level of the work. Regular ed teachers have got to care what special needs te teachers do. Principals and assistant principals have to absolutely love what teachers do and vice versa. Um, they can't think of their principal as the enemy. It's about we are all working together. And when one of the things that happened in Leslie that was so cool is that the kids became the advocates for the improvement. Mm. They began to see it. And so I think that that's what you find. I can't give you a here is some sprinkle water, although I did try that one time. I took in a, an empty uh, mirror <laughs> and I, I said, through the looking glass, I can see. I really did try that. It was a failure. Right. Right. But, but I, th I think you're, 
what you always have to do in going to, into any place. If you're a State Department person mm -hmm. and you set the parameter says, I am in charge of you and I'm going to be checking on this stuff, we're not going to make progress. It's just not, it's just not yep. going to happen. Yep. It has to be what kind of support here we need you here, mm -hmm. which is at 100% graduation rate. And right now you're here at 43%. Mm -hmm. What do you need? Right, right. And, right. and when you're not blaming the kids and you're not blaming the parents and you're, they could blame poverty, but they don't, they acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but these people say the how is, okay, we'll do whatever you tell us to. If you promise us, it's going to make us better. Mm -hmm. And then all we did was use quality tools, mm -hmm. systems, thinking, planning, plan, right. do, study, act, the things that most everybody is somehow familiar with. Um, and then you don't change your story just because everybody's unhappy. Right. You, you right. don't, um, even the, the workers that we had, and that was to me the secret to any successes during that time was that we did have teams of very qualified people in the schools every day. Mm. That mm. mattered. That mattered. Um, the commitment originally was for three years. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say that we had much more success in the rur rural, mm -hmm. you know, out in the country <laughs> right, right. areas than we did in the cities. Mm -hmm. But we still see, and we've talked about that in the second book, in uh, Jefferson and um, Fayette, mm -hmm. in, in both areas, there is amazing movement on the part of teacher leadership and ownership mm. did it come directly out of this initiative probably not but the conversation happened right 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 and that's right. the other thing that i say the people some of these districts that we were working in and some that the state has taken over have had trouble for 40 years mm -hmm. But you have to say, I'm going to be here until we get it. Right, right. I take away a lot from that thread in terms of data being my first takeaway, meaning that people need to know where they stand. They need to know where the targets are. And then supports would be my next sort of one word equity. What do you need to get there? You know, how do we identify those supports to help you? And then there's a word around presence. You know, we're going to be with you through the duration. We're going to be with you until you move out of turnaround into this next phase. And then hopefully uh, another word, we've built the capacity to, for you to sustain so that you now have a way of looking at data, identifying supports and providing leadership uh, with the people doing the work, uh, not to them, so that they can now execute whatever uh, changes about the bar, right? Right. So I was excited to sort of, whether it's Fleming and the advanced ed study they had where, you know, they started out and turn around and, you know, made it up to through a school of distinction. Right. I know that there were stories like that, that happened, you know, during that time that happened after that happened yes. before where the anatomy of the solutions is very similar. And if we can right. get leaders to kind of zone in on, it's not rocket science, as you say, but there's some components here that if you're a human being, you coach well, you support people, you show up and you keep doing the work. Is that not the impetus behind without trumpets, meaning that it's not fanfare, it's not big announcements, it's this continuous improvement journey, you know, because I think people look at that and I've encountered this in my own career with, well, that's hard. <laughs> well, yes. It, it yes. is hard, but it's the only way you can truly do it. Uh, and what I say about that is impossible, just takes a little longer. The, <laughs> you have to be committed to, uh, and I'll bring up another district, Breathitt, mm. um, that was famously called out in um, uh, a recent movie that I can't, oh, uh, <laughs> Hillbilly Elegy. Oh, yeah. Um, is one that was taken over by the state while I was there. Well, they're, they've now moved into just assistance. 
That's taken a decade, but guess what? They're still there and they're wow. getting better and better and they mm -hmm. own their system. Mm -hmm. They hired their own superintendent. I mean, so, but yes, it's that kind of commitment, but I would suggest to you if that school has existed since the 1930s, then if we had just been getting better all this time, what can you imagine might be happening? People do say to me, what you are advocating takes too long. Our politicians want to see those numbers go up immediately. And I said, you just keep them in the loop all the time. Let them know what's going on, what right. kind of bright lights we saw this semester, what we think that's going to lead us to. And for those that are truly interested, they'll stick in there with you and support you to the end. Mm. Other people who are your critics are going to be your critics. So listen to the criticism. Mm -hmm. If it's aligned with what you're working on, then care about that criticism. Mm -hmm. But if they don't like the fact that you painted the door red, mm -hmm. then that's, that's <laughs> you know, we don't right. have time. You know, somebody can talk to them about that, but and about grandma having the red door and, or not having a red door or whatever. It's just that we have to acknowledge that this is hard work, but... Mm -hmm. It is the same work. You know, you got to have some curriculum. Mm -hmm. You have to have methodologies and strategies for instruction. You have to manage children. You have to get them there. You mm -hmm. have to feed them. You have to <laughs> make sure that they're safe. And right. all of those are systems that mm -hmm. if you have them in place mm -hmm. and they are functioning well, then a politician can can get elected and do something crazy wild mm. and you just fit it into whichever system. Mm. Mm. You don't have to start all over again. And one of the reasons your first question was while I was still at it, there it is. Right. We okay. start over too much. Mm. We close down and we start up. Mm -hmm. We close down at the end of May this year, a crazy year, certainly. Mm -hmm. And now we're having summer sessions and we're going to close that. And then we're going to start the new session. No, right. no. If we're doing <laughs> right. continuous improvement, all that connects. That's right. And yeah. so that's, that is the learning that I had way too far into my career. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that time, it was just about aligning things, which I knew was a good thing. Mm -hmm. And making sure that everybody learns to appreciate each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to get high school teachers talking to elementary teachers now and then. And heaven forbid that we have a really regular conversation between the first year college uh, teachers who are just getting ready to, to, to train our next mm -hmm. group of teachers. Heaven forbid we actually have conversations with superintendents on a regular basis, right, right. being mm -hmm. sure that we're getting the mm -hmm. kind of preparation that's going to be needed right. and I have found that's nobody's fault mm -hmm. it's just the school sits over here and it does its thing it has academic freedom it has all kinds of things that I didn't know about until I started working with a, a college I didn't worry about those things but you've got to care about what those folks are going to bring back Mm -hmm. And so if their system is aligned to the K-12 system, then it would seem that we would be making more goals for students or become a reality that we will have achieved those goals. If we are listening to all our customers and stakeholders where they fit in the system, but unfortunately, we don't listen enough. And when we listen, we react as opposed to that's a part of the planning process. We're here with Susan Allred, uh, author of Without Trumpets, former uh, commissioner in uh, education in Kentucky of Next Gen Learning and a friend and colleague of Setzer Group. And we've been talking about a, uh, an array of issues. I want to uh, get Susan's take on the DEI movement a little bit. And before I do, I want to frame it in, in the, the lens of continuous improvement. You know, um, the, the comment I've made recently, and I, you know, happy for you to challenge it or correct it, but it's kind of like, it reminds me of literacy. We already know 
what works in teaching kids how to read. There's an empirical evidence-based work behind that. Whether people adopt it or embrace it, totally different thing. So getting people to actually understand literacy and to take them through you know, why a kid's brain works the way it does with neuroscience or what's the best practice in teaching reading across the curriculum. That, that's the hard stuff. So we've seen a year where when I look at the DEI lens through our time together, Susan, I often think about, you know, the model to raise achievement and close gaps. And one of the places that I think a lot of DEI practitioners would land is, do you, do you even know your data? Do you, have you even looked at the disparities within the data? And then once you look at that, what do you need to close that gap? Back to our former conversation, right? Mm -hmm. What do you need on the adult talent side? What do you need on the technology, the resources side, the community side? So I think what a lot of listeners are struggling with is they, they understand they need to become more educated and more aware, but actually applying those tactics to close gaps, that's where it's a little bit of a box right now. And people, are, I think, are struggling on how to move that forward. So I have some opinions on that and some ideas, but I'd be curious your take on what you've observed in the last year. Well, I need to go back much further than last year. Um, I was raised in a segregated South. I was raised in a segregated school, um, elementary level. We were integrated by the time I got to my junior and senior year in high school. Mm. But if you would ask me about how I approached mm. DEI when I became a teacher and I had my first a very integrated group. I mean, we had um, we had probably um, students from about nine different countries in in the in the school where it was, right. and um, we had a, a really large African American population for the times. It was about thirty percent in the school where I was teaching. Mm -hmm. But if you had asked me at the time how I was doing with that, I would have said just fine because I was loving on those kids. Right. You know, I'd hug them. I would just cajole them. I would get them to do whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was not meeting their mm -hmm. educational needs. Right. I was making them feel welcome in my classroom. And mm -hmm. I was a history teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I can say across the 20 years, I learned some more stuff, but I right. really want to speak to becoming a principal. Right, right. Um, we had a student in our school when I was an elementary principal mm -hmm. that everybody knew with one name. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been uh, an administrator <laughs> in a school, you had those. Right. Everybody knew them because they had one name because right. they were just handful all the time. Right. So uh, this particular child was in my office mm -hmm. in my first principalship. And I said to him, I called him by name and I said, tell me what would make it better for you at our school. You know, you're here every day. Right. We sit and we talk and you promise me you're going to be better and then you're not. Mm -hmm. so, so what would it take mm -hmm. for it to be better? And he said, you know what? Miss Allred, he said, I have never been in a classroom with another black kid. Mm. Mm. And my best friend gave me the best friend's name, mm -hmm. who was also, I didn't, he wasn't a one name kid, but it came close. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I pulled and I said, well, if you two were in classes together, you think you could behave and you could do work? He said, yeah. So guess what I did? I put them together. I talked to the teachers about it. I yeah. told them what I was going to do. I said, I'm making a deal with this kid. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty good year, not a perfect year, but a pretty good year. But in my learning as an administrator, mm -hmm. I realized we had practices in place to satisfy my staff as opposed to meeting the needs of the kids. And so then I became very conscious once I got to district level kind of stuff mm -hmm. about were we making all of our decisions in the best interest of all of our kids? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Another one at the high school level would be that a, a child had to make a certain score on um, the national merit exam, that, the first one, mm -hmm. before they could take an AP class. Well, no, African-American children made the required score, mm -hmm. but they were fine with it at the school right. that there weren't because they didn't make the cut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I look at DEI and I look at the past year, I just see more of what we've been talking about my whole career, mm -hmm. but we didn't say it loud enough, nor did we change things. Right. What I think has to happen is in systems thinking, mm -hmm. when you're looking at your system for curriculum and instruction, for instance, right. Look at the processes and say, what barriers are standing in the way for these children? Why are they not being successful? And what kind of supports do they need? Now, we make errors when we do that. I can recall a, a very specific episode, being a district level person, calling the schools in and just chewing them out over the test scores. And so this particular high school principal goes back and calls out the names of the kids who didn't do well. Mm -hmm. And they were all black kids over the intercom. Wow. He meant to do something good. He wanted to give them opportunities to help him understand what they needed to do. But boy, what a slap in the face. Right. But I would say that at least that got that guy talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, I hate it. Yes, it was embarrassing. Yes, it was the worst thing in the world. And at the same time, we talked to more parents than we'd ever talked. We had, we had more engagement. We got these conversations going about what kind of help and support they needed. So I wouldn't, the other thing I'm just saying here is, Brian, you gotta be willing to make mistakes Sure. Be called on it, apologize right. for it, make it better. But every time you look at a system, if it creates a barrier for anybody, yep. anybody, mm -hmm. then that's that's what I see DEI moving forward as. It is a, a methodology as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want us all to internalize it, get better at it. Right. But if we're afraid to try, right, 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 it's never going to be better. Yeah. I would rather be called out on doing a poor job than right. not doing anything. Yeah, I, I'm struck by a phrase I've been using for my own work, which is kind of, you know, um, unapologetically clumsy allyship, where it's mm -hmm. like, Yes, I'm going to write about it. Yes, I'm going to talk about it. Yes, I'm going to figure out ways to seed my power as a white male. If somebody emails me and says, hey, do you know anybody for this board? I don't immediately look to my white friends, right? I, I take a pause and I say, well, yes, I do. And I can connect you here, whatever the case may be. And I don't want to star for that. I want to be able to kind of you know, work my way through that conversation. And I think a second example I heard recently was like, um, you know, back to your curriculum point, has anybody looked at the content we provide kids and, you know, what does it look like in terms of being representative? That That's mm -hmm. something that, you know, is something we can tangibly say. And, and to your point, Yes, it's not good. Now, how do we start a process to get that better, right? right? And then that's the kind of work that one of the concerns I have for, and this is kind of leading to a final question, it's like one of the concerns I have in all of the movements that are afoot right now is that we have to be careful that we don't inadvertently throw out what works. And so there's this tension, I think, in education circles right now for, you know, it's, it's neuroscience, it's, you know, a DEI lens, it's, it's looking at this from a social emotional trauma perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it's all of those things. And 
there are some continuous improvement methodologies, some quality tools, some things we've learned along the way that applied with a new lens and integration can be just as effective, even more effective if we're all working together. So I'd love to kind of close our time with this question, like, you know, what's old is new, what's what's better is not always new or different. It's sometimes just what's better and people don't know about that or they're not aware. And so to frame it as a question, one of the things that you've cursed me with in our career in a good and bad way is this notion of quality tools, right? Because I always have to go through the language orientation of what that means for people. And I think we're at the same moment with DEI, by the way, where we have to kind of reframe, but also reground it in some stuff that we know will also work for it. So just curious your, your reactions to that thread. The ground has to be prepared for any innovation. When we talk about, we need to do it differently. It does not mean that we can't have sustainable systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The systems have to work in order for innovation to occur. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't know how those systems are built, and that's where quality tools come in. Mm -hmm. The PDSA is the one that I'm probably most notorious for. Mm -hmm. But when I actually was coaching people like with SREB and they say, well, that PDSA is just is sort of like, and they give me another process where it's got a plan, where they have a do, where they have to study and they have to act. Then they have to look at it again. Right. And I said, well, call it whatever you want to call it. Don't call <laughs> it a PDSA. If you right. don't want it to be a PDSA, if you have a problem with it, but what you've got to have are the component pieces that make you really include all the people that you need to include, have done the research that you need to have done, et cetera. I don't get hung up on the language. I love plus delta. That's the other tool that if I had, were a principal today, it would be the only thing, only rule right. that would be in my school. We mm -hmm. would just start with plus deltas for absolutely everything and we'll get better. That's how I, I know it. I believe it. But somebody did plus delta 20 years ago in my, in our particular district, let's say, and everybody's turned off to that. I said, okay, so don't do plus delta, do something else, but get daily feedback on what worked well today and what didn't. So I don't, I am not hung up on the, the specific protocols of quality although they are wonderful and I use them. Mm -hmm. But we are so hung up on, um, on terminology sometimes that we cease to prepare people to do the work that is required to be willing to take risk to reach out. And so I see innovation coming from strong systems where the systems are not frightened of variation because they understand how they need an outcome. Okay, so what's the outcome of the innovation? So you have litmus tests for every innovative step. So when I go back to when people say, oh, you're a systems person, that's old. Yeah, we did that 30 years ago. No, you didn't. I promise you, you didn't, right. 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 <laughs> because if we had done it well, we would be in a continuous improvement cycle, and our teachers wouldn't be frustrated, even once a pandemic hit us, right. um, but we didn't do that, and so my hope and, and my final um, swan song mm -hmm. is just simply that we keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm that we have as educators the opportunity to control from where we are. Mm -hmm. And if that's our classroom, if that's that assistant principal, or if it's um, that language arts coach, whatever, you can do mm -hmm. quality tools and quality processes and continuous improvement right where you are. That's a great way to close, I think. Uh... You know, we've had a, a fun time today uh, reconnecting with Susan Allred on our Berries for Breakfast um, live cast. You can find today's, um, you know, 
uh, session at setsergroup.com uh, on connect and we'll also be providing some resources on Susan's new book without trumpets both on our uh, social media channels and as we premiere and prep for the YouTube live event. Susan, thank you for joining us today. We are going to uh, go now to our after uh, live and talk a little bit more, but uh, uh, real treat as always. Thank you so much. Be courageous. Thank you.